So we're returning to um, our sermon series about doubt, and today we're going to wrestle with the question, is heaven real? Actually, we don't have to wonder about this because there's a book about it that says heaven is for real, and you can read that book, and if you don't feel like reading it, you can watch the movie. Heaven is for real. And that book and that movie is based on a story on the true life, near-death experience of a three-year-old boy who months after recovering from an emergency appendectomy surgery, starts telling his parents about going to heaven. The boy, Colton Burpo, provides incredible details about seeing people he could not have ever known in living or have known about. He spoke with his great-grandfather and called him by name, a name he had never been told. He visited a sister who had died long before Colton was born, who died during labor. Again, he knew his sister. My favorite part of the story, though, is that he sees Jesus, and Jesus is riding on a rainbow horse through clouds. If that isn't cool, I don't know what is. And I imagine most of us have heard stories about people returning from near-death encounters and seeing a tunnel and a bright light and feeling an overwhelming sensation. And maybe you've even experienced your own stories about heaven. So many stories make it hard to, for our not to believe that heaven is real. And yet, the only evidence that we have are experiences that happen in individuals' minds often within the realms of their own thoughts and when they're um, near death or uh, unconscious. Are they real or just the human mind yearning for something they want to believe? Stories about heaven comfort those who desire to believe and draw criticism for those who choose not to believe in God, in religion, in any afterlife. Our minds crave certainty. We want to know, to prove, to confirm what we are asked to believe is true. And unfortunately, we're always left with a mystery beyond our grasp, a mystery that often appears too fantastic to be true and beyond human proof. I have listened to hundreds of stories throughout my ministry about people encountering heaven or unexplained things. But then, I experienced my own. And the problem with my story is that it's more than my story. And I struggle with the modern concept of story ownership, or who owns a story, because my story is really a family story. And I don't think any one person gets the right to claim it, but the story I share today is mine. My version, my lessons, my experience, and the meaning I have drawn from it. It begins with a decision I made that still haunts me today. My children, I don't know if your adult children are this way, your teenage children are this way, they love to stay up late and text me meaningless things in the middle of the night. So like at 2 o'clock in the morning, your phone goes off, bing, 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 and you turn it on, you're like, oh, what emergencies happened? Hey, Dad, have you checked out this YouTube video of the raccoon on the building? (laughs) Yeah, thanks. I could have waited till morning. So on the evening of November 15, 2016, I decided to turn off my cell phone because I really needed sleep, and it was a bad, bad decision. I woke up the next morning to several frantic messages on my phone from my sister-in-law. She needed me to call right away and to come over. Her son, my nephew, Michael, had died, and she wanted us to come over. Michael was 26 years old, a graduate of Gustavus Adolphus College, and was living in Los Angeles, working on a master's degree at the University of Southern California in urban planning. He was a beautiful, tender-hearted young man who was more than a nephew to us and more than a cousin to my children. Several times over his life, when Michael's life kind of fell apart, he would come and live with us at our house. 
feeling alone in Los Angeles, he fell into a really, really dark place. And without kind of that pad there, he died by suicide. We gathered together to grieve his death, to mourn our loss. In the days and the weeks that followed, stories about encounters with him started to emerge all over the place. The might Michael died, the moment he died, his mother woke up from a sleep in a panic. He had visited her. She knew something was wrong, and she got into a frantic panic, not knowing what to do. After his funeral, there were all kinds of signs and events from Michael. Peggy's other sister, who lives in Milwaukee, was, looked out their window when they were thinking about Michael, and they saw a great blue heron standing in the snow in November in Milwaukee. Just how he got there, who knows. Michael's girlfriend asked us to light a candle on Sunday evening after the funeral at 7 o'clock. Everybody at 7 o'clock, light this candle and say a prayer. And we did. And as we sat there praying in silence, as we lit that candle, out of nowhere, a breeze came up. It rang the chimes of the wind chimes outside the window. And it only lasted for five seconds, and it was done. Michael visited Peggy's dad in his dreams. I think Michael's visits intended to give calm to his grieving grandfather. His grandfather was like a father to him, but it only caused deeper pain for Peg's dad. But the most remarkable story of all happened to me five years after Michael's death. When Michael was in college, he spent a summer living with us in Iowa, and he worked for me at Camp Shalom and made some really good friends on staff while he was there. And five years after his death, I returned to Camp Shalom to officiate a wedding of two former staff who were getting married. When the wedding reception was over, I found myself alone with two former staff. It was about 11 o'clock at night. It was late. It was dark. And one of the staff, Abby, wanted to tell me something, but was very reluctant. And you could tell that she was like, in her speech and in her physical, and I said, fine. I said, Abby, just go ahead and, and tell me. What do you got? She goes, I don't know how you feel about this, but let me tell you something. The night that Michael died, he visited me in my sleep. He told me he was all right and not to worry. He was in a good place. And she goes, I didn't understand the dream at the time until later the next day when you posted on Facebook that Michael had died. What made her story most remarkable to me, more remarkable than all the other things, at the time of that visit, the time that he encountered in a dream, Abby was working in the Peace Corps and was living in a remote village in the middle of Africa. She was a friend. She wasn't necessarily family. They, had a, they were friends, and they talked every three or four months, but it wasn't like this deep connection. I just like, how is that possible? She told me that not only did Michael visit her that night, he continues to visit her, and that he speaks to her in her dreams. And she looked up at me and she goes, matter of fact, he's standing right over there right now. And he wants you to know he's okay. Now, I believe in Jesus. I've always kept this thing like, I'm not eager to meet Jesus just yet. I was freaked out. I didn't know what to do. Because there's a lot of things that are going through my head. But I turned around and I turned to the direction that Michael was standing. I looked right in that spot and I said, yes, Michael, I know you are well. Because that's what he wanted to say. I said, you must, Michael, I know you're well and I know with utter confidence we will be together again. But you, you need to be at peace as well. I love you, Michael. 
As Abby and I turned to walk away, she said, well, you know, Eric, if you ever want to talk to him again, that's where to go find him. That's where he'll be. <clears throat> I've never returned to that place where Abby told me Michael would be. I have to be honest with you, I'm afraid. I'm afraid to make that journey, and I'm not sure what I'm more afraid of, that he would be there or that he might not be there. Because right now, it is a nice story. It keeps me, gives me confidence, but you can tell that a strain of doubt runs through my mind that he might not be there. Weeks later, I shared the story with my children, and it didn't go well. Um, Abby was a casual friend. My children were deeply bonded and connected to Michael. They were both angry and hurt that he had not come to them. And they were like, and they were just, you could feel them. They were just angry. Well, why does he come to us? They heard about him going to see Peg's dad or his mom, their aunts and uncles. Why not us? I didn't say anything to them then, but in my head, I'm sitting there thinking, what are you doing in your life to encourage that kind of conversation? You know, Abby has this conversation because Abby is in this deeply, she is a deeply religious person with, uh, that she has a spiritual discipline in her everyday life. She lives in a community that believes in talking to the family th that have passed away. So I keep that, what are you doing to my children that you're opening your heart to the mystery of God? It's kind of like wanting, getting mad that you can't speak Spanish when you've never even opened up a Spanish book or never tried. If you think that you can go into the Bible for a clear-cut answer about heaven, you are wrong. The Hebrew scriptures often talk about a place called Sheol, and Sheol is a dwelling place of the dead. In, in Greek, the word Sheol gets translated to the word Hades. In the ancient Hebrew world, those ancient Hebrew people, they lived in the right here and now. And they did not have any conception of life after death. To them, Sheol was a place where the dead went and slept and gathered and they just were there sleeping forever. Over time though, especially after the exile from Jerusalem, the Hebrew people started to evolve their understanding of life after death. Their musings were rooted in the visions of the prophets, and we find those in the words of Isaiah 25. The prophet starts to envision God defeating death. He wrote, and God will destroy in this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever then the Lord our God will wipe away the tears from all faces and the disgrace of his people will be taken away from all the earth for the Lord has spoken. This Hebrew people, they have a vision from the prophets that maybe Sheol isn't the final answer. Maybe there's something else. And onto the scene comes Jesus of Nazareth, and his resurrection is the game changer. It moves speculation into reality. When Jesus experiences death and then appears to his disciples and the other believers, people start to see. Humans do not just die. They die into new life. The joy of this truth becomes the absolute strength of the early Christians. They no longer feared death as they once did. They went out to work with those who were sick, diseased, those who were suffering because they did not fear death. Resurrection changed how the early followers interpreted the teachings of Jesus. He was more than a teacher. Now he's more than a prophet. He's more than a holy man. He opened up the world's eyes to a deeper truth. As Adam Hamilton notes when he cites Frederick Buchner, the resurrection means the worst thing is never the last thing. Ultimately, that is the truth and the strength that I find in my nephew's death. When he died, 
the greatest wound that he had that day that we were mourning was that he was in such a dark place and even more afraid that a dark place like that even exists. Yet in his coming to us in dreams and visions and to others, I continued to be comforted in my daily life that the worst thing any of us experiences is not the last thing. The last thing is always life. It gives me hope. It gives me confidence. And ultimately, it is the conviction that leads me to become a pastor. Michael witnessed to me something more than life after death. We so much think about life after death as like, are you going to be good enough to get into heaven? It has nothing to do with good or bad. Ultimately, what you learn in Michael's death for me is heaven is about healing. It's about wiping the tears away. In, in, he, in uh, Revelation chapter 20, one of the most beautiful lines that the Bible ends with is see the home of God is among mortals. He will be their God and they will be his people and he will wipe away the tears from their eyes. Can anything more intimate, any more vision be more intimate of love than that? And someday I will experience that same level of peace. His visitations always spoke to me about healing and all the scars that ripped him apart and tore him apart in his life are taken away and he's at peace and someday I will have that peace. Because if we're honest with ourselves in the midst of our doubt, we all have scars and wounds that we carry all the time. I just wish he could have trusted in new life when he was living with us. I don't know how to prove any of these things to be true, but I know the people who trust in them live lives of hope. And people who live in hope are infinitely more happy than those who do not. My favorite line, and really as it's related to heaven, I think about this line completely different. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And the hardest thing that I look back at Michael's life, his most dynamic experiences, his places of greatest comfort, of greatest peace, of greatest joy, were always connected to the church. His church took him on a trip to Cuba, and they went to Cuba, and he picked up Spanish, and he went to a Spanish immersion school in a low-income neighborhood in Minneapolis and gained life from that. It was ultimately his faith that drew us to his, our house. But then when he got older, he just wanted anything to do with it. He wanted nothing to do with it. He walked away from those things. When we talk about heaven, we'll hear people say, I believe in heaven or I don't believe in heaven. And the foolishness of that is heaven is a truth that is not determined by what you believe. It's either real or not real. But we are invited into that reality to live away in a truth so that we might have life. And I pray in the midst of our doubts that you would have life as well. Amen.